Okay, I think we're going to get started. It's 630. Um, we have our only WebEx speaker. We have Pat Carr joining us from the Central Ag Research Center in Moccasin. Um, he will be speaking to us today about pulses and oil seeds. So, Pat, if you want to share your presentation. Very good. Let's see here. Everybody see that okay? Yeah, we're good. All right. Well, thank you, Adrian, and, and thanks to those of you who are attending tonight's session. As Adrian said, she's asked me to talk about really six crops. If we have time, we can visit about others. Um, but the six she's asked me to address are two cool season pulses, lentil and pea, and then one full season pulse, chickpea. And then the oilseed crops she's asked me to address are really the same ones I talked about last year, and that's canola, flax, and mustard. So the, for those of you who, who uh, did hear me speak last year, my presentation is, is pretty close to what I gave last year on the oilseed. So I'd like to talk first about the pulses since I didn't really discuss them last year. So what I'm hoping can be accomplished over the next hour or so, and I invite feedback and questions and observations from you is to have a general discussion on production of each of the crops. It's hard to cover much in detail uh, in a, a time span like what we have tonight, so I want to identify some good sources for you for additional information to talk or make sure I include in the talk or presentation pest management considerations weeds, insects, and pathogens, and as I said, get feedback from you. All right, so to start off, um, these are the prices that we were quoted when we asked about them uh, this week. These are just ballpark prices, but uh, chickpeas, the expectation is um, pay will be somewhere in the 22 uh, cents per pound range in 2021. Field pea is going to be about half that, about 11 cents per pound, and then lentils will be close to chickpeas at about 20 cents a pound. Now, of course, it depends on who the buyer is, who you have, and and a lot of other factors, including the type of these crops that you're growing, and there's a lot of choices. In the case of lentils, uh, they range in color and range tremendously in size from the small blacks or beluga types to the very large French greens and everything in between. And this is not a complete list of all the options of lentils that you can grow, although in terms of management, you manage them pretty much the same. In terms of field pea, most of the, the, the grain field peas that we grow are um, planted in the spring, and they're yellow or green. But we also in Montana do grow a smaller acreage of Austrian winter peas. And then of course with chickpeas, there are two types again. There's the larger uh, Kabuli type, and then there's the smaller Desi type. But again, with all these choices that you have, you manage them pretty much the same way. Now, I, I, I'm assuming lentils have been around long enough. If you haven't grown lentils before, you at least have probably seen them, so you know how short they are. And when you look at the height of the lentil canopy, you have to realize that underneath that are where the pods are, are typically going to be found. So depending on the variety that you grow, a lentil pod may be as close as an, um, a couple inches from the soil surface. Chickpeas, it, I think many, if not everybody, has seen chickpeas before. They're going to be a little bit taller than lentils, a little bit easier to, to uh, harvest, but they're still relatively short. Peas, a, a lot of progress has been made in peas since I began working on them back in the, hate to admit it, but back in the late 80s. Um, today, pretty much all the grain peas that we grow, with the exception of Austrian winters if you're growing them, but the, the yellows and the greens are semi-leafless and they're fairly upright. 
Now, some varieties are more susceptible to lodging than others, but there are a lot of varieties that can be grown that are they're pretty up, upright, and the paws are going to be, uh, you know, pretty elevated from the soil surface. But with lentils in particular, and, all, and with all three, but lentils in particular, if you grow them in Montana, you're probably going to need to roll the field before you uh, harvest the lentils. Now, historically, the recommendation has been to um, roll the, the field prior to planting the lentils, but there's not complete agreement in that. Um, so there has been some evidence that perhaps rolling can actually enhance lentil growth a little bit if you delay it until the lentils have actually emerged. Conversely, there's a, a quite a bit of, of discussion about the fact that if you delay rolling until the lentils have emerged, you're going to damage the lentil plant. So really, there's, there's some contradictory uh, guidance in terms of when to roll the lentils. So as a result, at Montana State, and Perry Miller really is the one that is heading this effort, although several of us are involved. We're, we've got the study at CARC, and there are some other research centers in Montana, as well as in North Dakota. We're, we're trying to answer that question. When should you roll lentils? Should it be you know, before the lentils have emerged, or should it be after they've emerged? And if it is after they've emerged, how late can you go without damaging the lentil plant? This year, 2021, will be the third and last year of the study. We've got a lot of, of locations involved. So I think that we're going to be able to answer that question and, and from a research standpoint. And that question is, when is the best time to roll a, a lentil or a field where lentils are, are growing? Okay, I did get uh, data for this last growing season. These are acres planted for the six crops that uh, Adrian asked me to talk about tonight. I did throw hemp in here just because there's so much interest in hemp in, in Montana, a lot of questions about hemp. But in Ponderay County last year, uh, canola was planted on about 11,000 acres. That was followed by field pea at about 6,000 acres, lentils at about 4,000, then chickpea at about 2,600, and finally flax at 2,200. So when you compare the, the area dedicated to production of these crops to the ones we're most familiar with, uh, wheat in particular and barley, they're minor crops. Last year, wheat was, was planted on about 200,000 acres in the county and barley on 81,000. Actually, if you look at the number of fallow acres, it's second outside of wheat in terms of arable land dedicated to uh, to annual crops. So a lot of fallow in Pondery County, a lot of fallow in Montana. And these are the same six crops in Judith Basin County where the research center is located where I, I'm at. Um, you can see the rank relative to Pondery County, and you can see how they rank, again, uh, compared to wheat and barley. So my point in, in these two slides is to show I think there really is some potential for growth of, of the crops in both counties, uh, maybe as an alternative to fallow. Okay, so let's talk about production. First, uh, lentil and pea. <clears throat> Planting them in the spring at the research center. Uh, we like to get these in the, at right when we can in the field. They're the first crops that we plant each year in the field. Pea can germinate at temperatures as low as 38 degrees. Lentils requires temperatures a little bit above, well, about 40. So really the, the soil temperature that we target is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is, you may have heard of that before. That's the same temperature we really we target for small grains. So we could, you can plant lentil and pea um, when you would plant your small grains. And I think in, in most people's cases in the spring, that's going to be as early as you can get in the field. So we look for a, a, a relatively steady soil temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit or, or higher. Um, and that's when we plant. Now, if we do plant, and, and we want to, we want to get these, these plants in as early, early as they can so we can evade the, the really dry conditions that typically occur for us as we get into late June and certainly into July. 
these uh, lentil and pea and the pulses in general aren't, aren't as forgiving as say wheat is to to high temperatures and lack of precip. So if we can get the lentils and the peas in early so they're well on their way in terms of flowering, particularly peas, we tend to see a, a pretty good yield. If we delay planting and it's flowering when it gets hot and dry, that really hurts the yield of, of these crops. Okay. Now, if we do plant them in early like we want, it's going to take them a while to, to actually emerge. Germination is occurring, but it's going pretty slowly. So it can, it can take up to three weeks before you actually see a, a seedling emerge from the time you planted. So because the seed is in the ground for several weeks, we highly recommend the application of a fungicide to the, uh, to the seed to protect it from fungal attack. For us at um, Moccasin, we feel pretty good uh, when we get these, these pulse crops, lentil and pea in the ground in April, earlier the better, early to mid-April, we're, we're, we're pretty happy. Um, as we get into later in April and certainly in May, it's starting to get a little late for planting these, these two crops. Chickpea, we tend to plant a little bit later. We, we at the research center are targeting a soil temperature of closer to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's still pretty, pretty cool. Um, there are some claims that you can plant chickpeas at the same time that you plant lentils and peas. Um, I've tried to avoid that. You know, I've done that years and years ago, and we, we tended to get dinged pretty bad. Um, we feel okay if we get our chickpeas in in early May at the research center. You know, depending on the year and the growing conditions and the temperature, um, you know, we might get them in, in in late April, but we're not too nervous if we get them in in early May at Moccasin. Now, once we get into mid-May, mid then we're starting to get a little bit late. Once they've emerged, pea seedlings are, are quite tolerant to frost. They can um, tolerate temperatures as low as 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Lentils can tolerate temperatures a little bit warmer, but still pretty darn cold. Now, in our experience, you can't expect the, the plants to get dinged a bit. I mean, the, you'll be able to tell if they've been exposed to temperatures uh, that low. But in general, and, and some, some seedlings may not survive, but in general, um, we've been pretty, pretty pleased when we have had peas and lentils in the ground. They've been up. And frost comes along, and the stand still looks pretty good. They'll they'll recover, and the reason they do is these are kind of unusual broadleaf crops, in that they exhibit hypogeal type of emergence, which is just a fancy way of saying that the growing point on these plants remains below the soil surface until after those seedlings have emerged and begun to grow. So kind of like wheat, you know, unlike say soybeans, which we don't, don't grow too much out here under. Uh, really any conditions, you know, when that plant comes up, the growing point emerges uh, with the seedling above the soil surface. So uh, a killing frost is, is likely going to kill the plant, whereas with peas and with lentils like um, wheat, that growing point remains below the soil surface when that seedling first emerges, and so it's kind of protected from the really cold air temperature. Chickpea seedlings reportedly are similar in tolerance to lentils and peas. Um, but again, we do like to delay uh, when we're planting the chickpeas relative to lentils and peas. And they, you know, they'll, they will survive a frost, uh, although I'd be a little uncomfortable um, if they'd be exposed to temperatures as low as those of, of peas. If you haven't grown these crops before, a, a big difference between them and um, say wheat or barley is you've really got to place the seed into moisture. Um, so you typically are shooting for maybe a half an inch at a minimum to an inch below where the wetting front is in the soil. So most springs at the research center, we've been pretty fortunate. We've gotten enough snow and we're getting some now, you know, the last couple weeks that our seed beds should be fairly moist when we can finally get in and plant, but in dry years, you are gonna to have to kind of chase moisture. Why? Well, it takes, for example, a pea seed about three times the amount of moisture that must be available to a wheat kernel in order for that pea seed to germinate. So they, they've gotta be placed into moist soil. <clears throat> 
Now, P, you know, it's a large seed. Even the smaller varieties, relatively speaking, are pretty large. You can plant peas down as deep as three inches in, in you know, sandier soil. Lentils, reportedly, you can go down that deep. I tend to avoid that. Um, we've gone down as deep, though, as two and a half inches. But if you do plant deep, because, again, you've got to go after moisture, um, you're going to have to adjust your seeding rates most likely and increase them some because not all those seedlings planted that deep are actually going to emerge. And that really is about as deep as you can go. I, I wouldn't be at all comfortable planting a peas or particularly lentils any deeper than that. Firm moist seedbed, like every crop that we can think of, is, is the ideal seedbed. So in, in Montana, a really great seedbed is planting these, these pulse crops after a small grain. Okay. And in a no-till seabed, better yet, because it does tend to be um, uh, moist. Targeted uh, plant population for pea from 7 to 10 seedlings per square foot. Lentil. Lentil's not competitive with weeds, so you've got to increase the uh, plant density. So the recommendation in Montana is somewhere between 11 and 15. In the case of chickpea, uh, more like four to six. Now, what does that mean if you don't think in terms of of number of seed per square foot or per acre? And it's really highly recommended because the pea size, size, lentil size, and chickpea size varies so much. But in the case of peas, to get that kind of plant population, depending on the variety that you're growing, you're going to be seeding anywhere from 80 to 200 plus pounds of seed. So if you if you typically are going off a, a pounds of seed per acre, um, you know you may be in that ballpark of what you're shooting for. You may be way over. You may be putting down more seed than you need. Um, so it 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 is good in in the case of these crops because the seed size varies so much. I mean it varies in wheat, but it really varies when we're talking about these pulse crops, depending on the variety and the seed lot that you you really need to to think about a planting on the basis of, of seed per acre or per square foot, okay? In the case of lentils, you can see, you know, from 40 to 80. With chickpeas, uh, you know, 110 to 160 pounds if it's a larger Kabuli type, 80 to 100 pounds if it's a smaller Desi type. And then, uh, Adrian asked if we just, I'll go through all the pulses and then kind of open it up for questions and then we can move from there. Okay, so let's briefly talk about uh, disease. I think we've all seen the disease triangle. Mary Burroughs and others have done a really great job, I think, of educating all of us in this area. It's just a reminder for any plant disease to develop, you need three things and they all have to be present or that disease will not develop. Well, you have to have the, you know, the crop that is susceptible to that disease. So like ascochyta blight in the case of chickpea. Okay, you obviously have to have the, the disease pathogen present, but thirdly, you have to have the environment that favors the development of that disease. If any of those factors, including a favorable environment, do not exist, the disease is not going to develop. Okay, so how about disease with these pulse crops? We really didn't worry too much about them years ago when pea, lentil, and particularly chickpea weren't grown in Montana. But we are now, you know, we now lead the country in the production of these crops. We've seen them uh, on our farms for several years. And so we're starting to have bigger problems with some of these pathogens. Fusarium root rot in pea and lentil in particular are becoming much more of a problem. Really does impact uh, the growth of the plant. In some cases, it'll, it'll kill the plant. You can see symptoms of fusarium root rot in peas shown here on the left. Patches uh, like this, if you notice them in your lentil crop, are a pretty good suggestion that it might be anthracnose. And ascochyta blight, there are races of ascochyta blight that not only attack and infect chickpea, but, but races that attack and infect lentils. So there are a lot of fungal diseases out there, and, and they are becoming more common in Montana. They, sim they simply are. 
Well, how do we manage for a disease? With many, not all, but many diseases, crop rotation can be very effective. It certainly can be effective, effective with some of the fungal diseases. Variety selection, and a, a case in point is chickpea. And I began working on chickpea back in the early 90s, and it was just starting to move into North Dakota where I was at. And, if, and if there was high demand for it, prices were fantastic. So all the farmers in the area around the research center where I was located at began to grow chickpeas. And within a few years, uh, Ascochyta blight moved in and it basically wiped out a chickpeas from being grown in that area. Well, back then we didn't have the varieties that are available today. Many of them have been bred for resistance, not tolerance, but resistance to Ascochyta blight. So, so that can be a very good tool along with rotation. Cultural practices, including making sure that your seed source is disease free. That's very, very important in the case of chickpeas again, making sure the seed that you, you purchase um, is free of that disease because it can uh, carry from the seed lot into your crop. And in the case of, of fungi, there are fungicides, uh, post-emergence fungicides that can be applied and sometimes are warranted and are needed. All right, in terms of um, crop insurance, you know, all three crops can be insured in, in Ponderay County, but there are some re rotation requirements that uh, the grower of an insured crop must follow. In the case of peas and lentils, if growing them in a field, it's two years out before you can grow that crop again. So if you're going to grow pea in a field in 2021, to maintain insurance um, presently, the next time you can grow pea in that field is 2024. Or if you want to grow pea in a field in 2021, you have to make sure that no pea was grown in that field uh, after 2018. So it's two years out, okay? And the same is true with lentils on lentils. Now, in the case of chickpeas, it's actually three years out. And that's because of all the concern primarily with ascochyta blight. Okay. Now, growing other crops, other, the other pulse crops, it's one year out. So let's say that you're, you know, you grew peas in 2020. You cannot grow lentils, insured lentils. Um, in 2021 in that field, but you could in 2022. So it's one year out, okay? And that's also true with lentils. The thing that you also need to remember is this applies whether those crops are grown alone for grain or if they're included as a, as a cover crop, either alone or more likely in a mixture. So cover crop cocktails or, you know, cover crops, also used as a forage, if they have pea as one of the nine or 10 crops in that mix, doesn't matter how many crops are included. If peas are one of them, that counts as if you were growing peas alone in that field in terms of insurance. So if you wanna grow peas in a field in 2021, you have to make sure that peas were not grown in any way, shape or form in that field in 2020 and in 2019. And that's also true for lentils, and that's also true for chickpeas and mixtures. Okay, now let's look at insects real quick. And I think the one that you can pretty much count on being a problem is pea leaf weevil and pea. We've grown uh, pea at the research center and also at farm sites spread across the central part of the state from Chinook down to south of Moccasin. And we've always encountered pea leaf weevil. So it's kind of like if you're growing canola, you can expect to see flea beetle. If you're growing pea in, in our experience, you can expect to see the pea leaf weevil. This is pretty diagnostic of pea leaf weevil present in, in a pea field. Notice the serrated edges along the margins of the leaf. So that's feeding damage caused by the adult. But you don't see a damage that is occurring 
underneath the soil. They'll lay eggs, the eggs hatch, larva will, will uh, emerge, will burrow into the soil and they'll feed on the roots. And they cause direct damage to the pea plant in terms of root feeding, but just, or maybe even more importantly, they really, really impact nitrogen fixation by the pea crop. They can really reduce, if, if not controlled, the amount of end fixed by peas. So they can be a very damaging insect. So if you're growing peas, uh, the rec my recommendation is you're gonna need to apply an insecticide to that pea seed. And because we typically plant peas and lentils early, so it's gonna take those seedlings two, probably three weeks to emerge, depending on how fast the soil warms up. That insecticide is, is going to lose some of its efficacy. So most likely when you're growing peas, and at least this has been our experience at the research center and, and on farm when we've got studies going on, we, apply an ins we, we plant seed that has an insecticide applied to it. We also have to apply an, an insecticide post emergence. Now we've only uh, had to do that once. In some cases, um, some of my uh, counterparts have had to apply an insecticide two times, um, rarely three, but twice <clears throat> to really uh, kill the pea leaf weevil to the point where they, they really don't have to uh, be too worried or concerned about it. We, we've only had to apply an, an insecticide after the peas have emerged once, but we, we've always had to do it. Other insect pest of the pulses, these pulses that I'm talking about are, are more general feeders, so you're familiar with them most likely. Um, wireworm, cutworm, grasshoppers, um, these will feed on the crops. Now I am gonna say just something real quickly about grasshopper. Back in North Dakota, this was back in the 90s, we actually, there was an entomologist, pretty good entomologist who did a feeding trial, and I was at one of the research centers where we did this. And he found that grasshoppers would literally starve to death rather than eat peas. So he concluded that grasshoppers really avoid peas relative to anything else out there that's green. Now, since that time, I've, had, I've heard of farmers who have told me, well, they like the peas on our farm, okay. Um, but, but there is, I guess, a little bit of a, a, a possibility that at least grasshoppers prefer other crops to pea as a crop to feed on. There is some evidence of that, although it's not, it, it's not evidence that some uh, don't disagree with, I guess is what I would say. Okay, I talked about these last year. I know I came from NDSU, but I, I promise you I'm not being biased. Um, but I do think the North Dakota Weed Control Guide is is excellent. Um, it's an excellent source of information for Montana farmers, just like North Dakota farmers. The North Dakota Field Crop Insect Management Guide is a good guide, you know, if you have insect problems. There's a wealth of information in here. You know, they publish uh, these guides every year. I always get copies. You don't have to, it's just there's a lot of information in here and it's very good. It's easy to find. I really, really like them. <clears throat> the one caveat, though, that you need to be aware of is, you know, there's a lot of herbicide recommendations um, in terms of, of weeds in the weed control guide and insecticide recommendations in terms of the field crop insect management guide, in addition to uh, other management. About 97% of the chemicals that are labeled for use in North Dakota are also labeled in Montana, but there, there are a couple exceptions. So, you know, if you use the North Dakota Weed Control Guide, which I do, to provide me with, um, you know, good information, I do always double check and make sure that what they indicate is labeled in North Dakota is also labeled in Montana. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, Let's talk about nutrient management now, and, and really I'm gonna focus on nitrogen. And that's a big uh, attraction, I think, that the pulses have for, for us as growers, 
particularly in the context of rotation. They're legumes, they're capable of fixing nitrogen biologically. Nodulation or the formation of these nodules or growths on the root of these plants begins about two to three weeks after the plant emerges. So for the first two to three weeks after that wheat plant emerges, that little seedling, it is no different um, than a wheat plant in terms of where it's getting its nitrogen. It's not fixing any in, it's getting the nitrogen that it needs from the soil, okay? So nodulation begins two to three weeks after that seedling emerges. A week or two after that, biological infixation actually begins under the right conditions. So if you've got a wheat field or a lentil field, or for that matter, a chickpea field, it's gonna take anywhere from two to three weeks after you see the seedlings emerge before the nodules form. And it's gonna take another week or two after that until nitrogen fixation occurs. And until that occurs, those little seedlings, again, are just like barley or wheat or any other crop that you're growing. The nitrogen that they need is, is gonna be coming from the, the soil or some other source of nitrogen because they can't fix any yet. Well, how do you know if the the pea field that you have is actually actively engaged in nitrogen fixation. Well, a pretty good indication, you know, it's, it's, it's very diagnostic, is actually to go out and dig up, you know, a couple of the plants and look at the root system and you'll see the nodules. If you don't see any nodules, that's a pretty good indication that nitrogen fixation isn't occurring, but you, you'll see nodules. Cut the nodules open. They're pretty easy to cut open. You know, they're small, but, clearly visible, cut them open. If they're pink or red inside, as you see in the image here, that's a pretty good indication that nitrogen fixation is occurring and those nodules are active. If you cut them open and they're more like a white or a, a cream colored, or maybe even a kind of a real a pale green, unfortunately, that's a, an indication that infixation is not occurring. The nodules may have formed, but they're not effectively fixing nitrogen. Now, the amount of N that is fixed really depends on the species. Of the three that I'm talking about this evening, in Montana, generally speaking, peas are fixing a little bit more N than chickpeas, which are fixing a little bit more N than lentils. All three under ideal conditions can fix a lot of nitrogen biologically. But how often do we have ideal conditions under dry land management in Montana? But still, if managed correctly, they should fix in for you. Now, how can you improve as a, as a farmer, a manager, nodulation and infixation in your pulse crop? Well, make sure if whoever is storing the inoculant, whether that's you after you purchase it prior to use or the supplier is storing it in a cool, dark place. There are three uh, carrier forms of inoculant that can be used. A peat-based inoculant, this is probably the most common, it's been around the longest. Granular inoculant, okay, it's another solid form. And liquid, which a fair number of Montana farmers use, a, a liquid, a form of inoculant. Granular is, is more reliable than liquid, especially at low pHs, as we get below uh, an acidic pH of 5.4. Now, we didn't think about this too much 30 and 40 years ago in Montana, but I think Clay Jones has made us, our Rick Engels, or both of them, have made us much more aware of, of really the problem we're having in Montana with the acidification of our soil. So this is a bigger deal than it used to be. And of, the, of those types of inoculant forms, granular would be preferred in lower pH soils. Make sure you use the inoculant that uh, is adapted to the crop species that you're growing. With lentils and peas, you use the same inoculant type. It's Rhizobium leguminosarum uh, type C. And, that, and you use the same inoculant for peas and for lentils, okay? But for chickpeas, it's a different inoculant. So you cannot take the inoculant you're using with the peas apply it 
or use it with chickpeas and hope that that inoculant is going to stimulate infixation in those chickpeas. It's not. So you need a different inoculant for chickpeas than you do for lentils and peas, but the, a common inoculant is used for lentils and peas. It's, it's effective on both. Make sure you apply the inoculant at the appropriate rate. Avoid placing fertilizer in row with seed that's inoculated if you want to maximize biological infixation. Fertilizer salts can be a problem with legume seed, and they can also be a problem with the bacterium, which is what is really fixing the nitrogen. They'll kill it. To maximize nodulation and fixation, you have to ensure that the other nutrients that a plant needs are available. And really to maximize nitrogen fixation by any pulse crop, you've got to place it in a low nitrogen environment because that nitrogen that's been fixed biologically is not free. That pulse crop is contributing carbon in the form of sugars to those bacteria. So it's kind of a, a, a trade. A bacterium provide nitrogen to the pea plant, but the pea plant is providing sugars to that bacterium. So if you plant pea in a field that's got high levels of nitrogen based on soil tests, it's not going to fix much, nitro or much nitrogen. It's going to use the nitrogen that is available to it. If you take that same pea crop and place it in a field that's very low in nitrogen, it's likely going to fix nitrogen. So if, if you, know, you really want to utilize legumes as a, a natural source of nit nitrogen, place them in an environment where the nitrogen is low to, to benefit the most. It's not going to hurt you but it, it may not help you. And if you're applying fertilizer nitrogen with your pulse crop, it's gonna use that nitrogen first before it does any infixation. In Montana, because you know, in, under dry land management, we're usually fighting dry conditions. Uh, No-till fields do tend to promote nitrogen fixation simply because they, they tend to be moist. And those conditions which favor plant growth also tend to favor the bacterium which is fixing nitrogen biologically. Okay, nodules are very sensitive to drought stress just like plants are. These are some data that were collected several years ago in Gallatin Valley and all of the slides on nitrogen fixation were provided to me by Plain Jones. So along the y-axis you can see the town's uh, per acre of nitrogen fixed from 0 to 140. Along the x-axis, you see the two crops, lentils and peas, and then you see the amount of nitrogen fixed in the bars. You know, on the screen in front of you, you can see the blue bar indicates the amount of nitrogen fixed at the flowering stage of the plant, and the green bar, the amount of nitrogen fixed at the pod formation stage of the plant. And you'll notice a couple things. First, if you compare dry versus wet, you'll see gen, a general trend for more nitrogen to be fixed under wet conditions than under dry conditions. The second thing you'll notice, particularly or, or specifically in the case of P under dry conditions, that the amount of nitrogen fixed by the time the pea plant flowered was basically all the nitrogen you got from that pea plant. And that makes sense. Drought conditions developed. So initially the pea plant was able to fix nitrogen biologically. As those drought conditions persisted, the pea plant began to shut down. Those nodules ceased being functioning and they were sloughed off and you really didn't get any additional benefit. So drought does impact not only what you see above the soil surface, what you see below the soil surface. So infixation can stop by flower stage, at least in P under dry conditions. And you don't get the additional benefit of nitrogen being fixed that you would in wet conditions by the time the pods have begun to develop in the pea plant. 
Now, legumes fix nitrogen biologically. But consultants and others, not all of them, but some, do suggest adding some fertilizer nitrogen when you're growing these pulse crops in a field as a pop-up or a starter, typically. Why? I told you earlier that you know, one way to reduce the amount of nitrogen fixed by a pea or a lentil plant is to place it in a field that has a lot of nitrogen or to apply fertilizer. Well, recall a couple of things uh, first. Nodulation is, is carbon expensive. I, I told you that already. The, the bacteria are going to use some of that photosynthate that that's, that plant is using. Well, if bacteria aren't using that photosynthesate, the plant can use it. So it is a little bit of a, a trade-off. But remember that nodules don't form on legumes until, what, two to three weeks after you first see them pop up out of the ground, and it's another week or two after that before nitrogen fixation kicks in under, under good conditions. So there is some time there where if the pea plant is, is in a nitrogen deficient environment, it's going to be under stress. It needs some nitrogen. And in those cases, a pop-up or a starter uh, nitrogen, not a whole lot, but just enough to get that pea plant going is a good thing until nitrogen fixation actually kicks in. Now, if you don't apply any in, sometimes it's going to take those plants that are relying on nodule formation and biological infixation a couple weeks to really get growing in really low nitrogen environments. And that makes sense. They need nitrogen just like any other plant. And until those nodules form in a low end environment, they're not going to grow real well initially. Again, if, if in a nitrogen deficient environment, plants can initially grow very, very slowly. It just takes them a while to get going. Now, once the nodules form and biological infixation begins to kick in, then they'll, they'll grow out of it. Why apply fertilizer in, uh, particularly as a pop-up or a starter? It's really insurance if you do have a pea leaf weevil problem. And that is something I think as, a, as another aside or caveat, if you've had a severe pea leaf weevil problem and you, and you really weren't on top of it, the chances are pretty good that your crop is not going to be real effective at fixing in. And in that case, it may make some sense to apply some nitrogen fertilizer as an insurance against that nodule loss. All right, uh, again, and lastly, remember that, you know, those conditions which favor plant growth also favor biological infixation. So under stress conditions, in, in many instances, biological infixation is going to react the same way a plant does, and it's going to start to slow. So again, in those cases, a little bit of, of in fertilizer may help. Now, I'll be honest with you personally, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a big proponent of this. I did some work on this several years ago and really never found a yield advantage when we applied a startup, a pop-up fertilizer versus just making sure the plants were inoculated properly. But uh, I will admit that there are uh, research studies which do suggest that a, a little bit of a pop-up or starter fertilizer uh, does provide advantages in some instances to a pea or a lentil or even a chickpea a crop. Okay, um, in terms of harvesting, pea, chickpea, a lentil, um, but particularly pea and chickpea, you know, if the seed gets too dry and you don't, you can't handle it as roughly as you can a small grain, I guess is what I, I will say. Those, those pea seeds are, can be large, um, as can Gar uh, chickpeas, and you know you really have to to handle them a little more tenderly than you would a, a wheat kernel or a barley kernel, or you're going to have split uh, peas, and it's going to be a problem. So you need to to slow your cylinder speed down. You need to open the concaves up quite a get, bit more, and you're probably not going to be able to harvest as quickly as you would say a small grain crop. Okay, 
lentils too, if they get too dry, they can they can um, split. So you just have to to be a little more careful and slow things down when you're harvesting these crops. You can straight cut peas I, I, anymore. I don't know too many people who swath peas first. Lentils are more uh, commonly swathed than the other two crops. They are very, very short. Also unlike the other crops, with the exception of clear field lentil, you have very few, if any, uh, broadleaf herbicide options once the lentil has emerged. So lentil fields are probably gonna be a little weedy. And that's one recommendation is, you know, if you have a broadleaf weed problem, lentils are probably not, not the best choice of, of crop to grow. Um, but for those reasons, it's not uncommon to swath a lentil crop first and then to, uh, you know, pick it up. Okay, so I've gone pretty quickly, I know that, but um, that's, that's what I wanna say about the pulses. In terms of additional sources of information, uh, Kent McVeigh down at Huntley and several others, you can see Mary Burroughs, uh, Klain, uh, Fabian Manalid, and others um, put this uh, production guide together I think it was 2011, so it's a little bit dated, but it's still pretty good. It provides a lot of good information. North Dakota does have very good production guides of all three crops. Um, so they're another good source of information and, and the Canadians do as well. So I, if you like printed material, there's actually quite a bit that's available for us that is very pertinent to Montana. In terms of, Researchers, in addition to myself, there's a lot of really good ones in Montana who've been working on these crops for a long, long time. I, I would assume many of you know Clayne Jones. Uh, Clayne would be a, a great person to consult with in terms of nitrogen fixation or just fertilizer management in general with these crops. Perry Miller, Perry's been at MSU for a long, long time. Uh, Perry really is considered one of the experts in the research world in terms of uh, pulse crop production in in the northern great plains so not just montana but also north dakota and you know in idaho so he's another very good source chengxi chen chengxi was at uh Moxon before i showed up uh, he's now at sydney but he has a lot of experience on the pulses uh, and a lot of that's in in central montana so those are three good sources um, and there's others, Kent McVeigh, there's, there's a lot of folks at MSU, I think, who have a, a lot of experience with these crops. A lot of extension educators have worked with these crops. And certainly there are crop consultants and a lot of farmers in Montana have a lot of experience working with these crops. So I think there's, there's good sources of information for, for anybody who hasn't grown these crops, who's considering them, or even somebody who is familiar with these crops and you know, wants to hear about it, you know, if you haven't harvested them before, say with a stripper header, there are people who have, and um, you know, it doesn't take a lot of, of hunting to track them down. So Adrian, myself, and others, I think, we'd be more than willing to to either do our best to answer questions for you or to steer you to somebody who can. So Adrian, if it's okay, um, if there are any comments right now, maybe we could um stop and and address them. And if not, I'll move on to the oil seeds. Does that sound okay? Yeah, do we have any questions for Pat on pulses? Mm, nothing in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any specific Do you have any specific studies about starter fertilizer with peas and the yield response? Um, I don't have any recent research myself clean would i think in montana clean would be the um probably the person to consult with for um any any recent study in montana i the work i did i did do work on that but it was back in the 90s in north dakota and i i can tell you that i i don't remember how much in you know we started at really low rates it was all pop-up fertilizer of I don't remember if, if, you know, it was 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, I can't remember. I do know that we never saw a yield response. And we did it at three locations over two years, and at all six of those environments, we never saw a yield response. So, you know, I don't want to bias you too much, but again, um, I, I tend to not 
promote that a whole lot, but I think Clayton is as much uh, a stronger believer in it, and I think he's got some data to support that. So I don't know if that helps, but Clayton would be, if you haven't asked Clayton before, I would I would visit with Clayton because he would have, I think, the best information of that Montana in general. All right, anything else? Anyone online? Okay, I don't see anything, so we can. Okay. Move on. okay. You know, I guess I'll, I'll add one more thing before I do go on, uh, just to make you aware of the fact. I don't know if on your particular farm you have a sulfur problem or a sulfur deficiency. We do at the research center. And one thing that we are going to be looking at, and again, this was generated by Clayne Jones. Clayne did a study last year where he actually found a pretty significant sulfur response by lentil in a, in a in an area that was low sulfur. So we're gonna to start to take a, maybe a little bit closer look at sulfur in terms of lentil response in, in environments where our sulfur is low. And as I said, there are places at, the, at, at and around the research center, I know that we, we do have low sulfur problems. So we're hoping to get uh, support for that. We'll, don't plan on doing it in 2021, but we'd like to start in 2022. And Clean does have some data on that though. So if you're interested in that, again, visit with Claim. Okay, so Just let's have one come in over the oh, chat. Um, okay. Would starter fertilizer impact the nodulation in a positive manner or not? It won't impact it in a positive manner. I mean, that's the short answer is no, it, it will not impact it in a positive manner. Um, but the, the thought is, you know, if you apply a starter and not much nitrogen, I mean, we're not talking very much. It's just enough to get that seedling through those first couple weeks until nodules form. The thought is it won't really negatively impact the formation of the nodules. So it's it's not going to help in, in nodule formation, but probably, you know, the, the thought is it, it wouldn't it wouldn't really hurt it much if you're not applying a lot and the idea with the starter is just just to get enough for that seedling to, to grow in and, and going before the nodules really start to fix nitrogen another one online um what are your thoughts on yellow peas under wheel lines or pivots oh, I, I i can't uh respond to that i'm sorry i don't have uh, experience with um irrigated crops i'm i'm a dry land guy I apologize. Um, Perry Miller might. Perry, you know, is in Bozeman, so he might have direct experience with that. Anything else? I think we're good now. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the oil seas. This is going to be a little bit faster. Um, oh, my goodness. How much time do I have to talk about oil seeds, Adrian? You can have as much time as you want. Okay. Well, I, I will try to go faster with this. That took a little bit longer than I had rehearsed it. Okay, with the, the oil seeds, <clears throat> here are the prices we were quoted. Uh, 20 cents a pound for canola in 2021. Um, 19 cents a pound for flax. Mustard's a little bit higher at 24 to 30 cents a pound. Again, you, you want to plant a canola. I'll talk about canola and mustard first early. Um, canola can germinate at temperatures of about 36 degrees Fahrenheit, but again, it's slow. So in terms of temperature, we're going to target really about the same temperature that we do for our lentils and peas, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit or small grains. And everything's pretty much the same. You can plant you know, canola and mustard that early, it's probably going to take a little bit longer to emerge. Um, but we want to try to get them in early again to avoid that, those hot, dry conditions that hit us, you know, once we get into July. So at the research center, we'll plant canola uh, right after we plant, and mustard, right after we plant uh, lentils and peas. So for us, that means mid to late April is kind of what we're shooting for uh, on, on average. They both can tolerate temperatures that are also uh, pretty low. Um, you will definitely see them get dinged and some of the seedlings will not survive. But, you know, if you're planting them at the appropriate seeding rate, I think you'll still be pretty pleased with the stand. 
Canola is a little bit less tolerant than mustard to spring frost, and mustard is less tolerant to, than is peat, uh, than is wheat, I'm sorry, or pea for that matter. They are small seeded, as I think we're all aware, so you cannot plant them um, deep like you can a pea. We try to plant within an inch of the soil surface. I get pretty nervous when we go deeper than that. There are some reports that you can plant them as deep as two inches. I sure wouldn't want to try that, but some of you may have and have had success, your neighbors have, um, but that, that would be awful deep. And just as the case with the pulses, the deeper you go, um, you know, especially as you start to get uh, much below an inch, you're going to have to adjust your seeding rates up. At least that would be my recommendation. Firm moist seedbed, excellent seedbed is following a small grain. Okay, now one thing to be aware of is there has been some observational data collected that frost damage can be worse in fields where these crops are planted in tall, dense, small grain stubble, like small grain stubble where a stripper header has been used the previous year. So you got a lot of residue, you know, if it was a high yield year and you used a stripper header, <clears throat> you could you could see uh more severe frost damage in that field because of the microclimate that's been created. <clears throat> With mustard, because you really don't have any uh, broadleaf weed control options once that crop is, is up, you want to avoid fields where you have heavy broadleaf weed pressure. It's really not a problem anymore with canola if you're growing um, a clear field canola or, uh, you know, you're growing some other a type of canola that's resistant to herbicides. Targeted established population for canola is 9 to 14 plants per square foot. With yellow mustard, it's 7 uh, to 11. You can see the seeding rates for the, the two types of canola. A lot of what we grow is the Argentine type, 4 to 8 pounds, a 3 to 6 for Polish. It's a little bit larger, so on average, maybe around 5 or so pounds. But it does vary depending on the variety that you're growing in the type. And you can see with yellow mustard, we grow a lot of yellow mustard. Most of the mustard we grow in Montana is yellow, uh, 7 to 10 pounds. Now, I think in Montana, really one thing that has generated quite a bit of interest is, is winter canola recently. It's been around for a while, but I think we all have, have seen and been very impressed with some of the winter canola fields that we've seen in central Montana the last couple of years. I mean, they look great. And uh, this is one of the areas, again, where we at Montana State are, are really starting to conduct research because we, we just haven't done that much on it. Um, the, the old recommendations were, if you wanted to plant a winter canola that you needed to plant it in early September. Well, a lot of growers I know are planting it earlier than that. So we are uh, taking a look at when should we plant winter canola? How early do we have to plant it in order to optimize winter survival? The idea is, though, you do need some, some growth on that plant going into the winter, five leaves maybe before it frees up. Recommendation is that you increase your seeding rate to take into account some winter canola that's going to occur, but canola seed can be very expensive anymore. So we want to take a closer look at that as well and determine, well, do we really need to increase the seeding rate, and if so, by how much? Because that's, you know, we don't want to plant at a heavier rate than we need because we're it costs us money. In terms of planting depth, um, you know, here, yeah, you want to plant as shallow as you can, but again, it's, it's like any other crop. If you plant the, put the seed in dry soil, it's not going to do anything until uh, some moisture uh, occurs in that seed bed. So, okay, yellow mustard, let's, if you're driving fast along the road, it, I can't tell the difference between the two when they're flowering. If you go a little bit slower, you can, but um, they do look pretty similar. As a plant, though, they're very, very different. Um, mustard, yellow mustard in particular, is, is hairy or has pubescence on everything. The leaves, even the petioles when they're up. I mean, everything's got little hairs on it. A canola doesn't. Okay, big insect pests, as I mentioned earlier, and for those of you who have been around canola, you know this, it's flea beetle. If you're growing canola, 
you're going to have flea beetles. They're going to be around. Um, <clears throat> the economic threshold you can see is about 25% of the codlings of the first true leaf is defoliated. If that's the case, um, insecticide treatment is recommended. Now, canola, you know, once it starts to warm up, canola is going to grow fairly quickly. So if you can get past that stage, even if the flea beetles are in there, typically the canola is going to be able to, to um, to outgrow the damage that the flea beetles are doing. So usually it's not recommended that an insecticide is applied, although flea beetles can come in later and, and feed on the pods. So they're gonna be out there. If you are growing canola, it, it, you, you need to apply an insecticide to your seed uh, to suppress flea beetles, okay? <clears throat> now, flea beetles, you'll find them in mustard. They tend not to be quite the problem in mustard uh, that they are in, in canola. And it may have something to do with that pubescence. So here is the the life cycle of the flea beater beetle. It does overwinter in the states. So that's one reason why. I mean, if you grow canola, especially these days, it's it's almost guaranteed that you're going to see flea beetles in your field. Um, they emerge, you know, in the spring. They lay eggs. Um, the larva, again, can feed on the roots, so they're not quite the same problem that the pea leaf weevil is. And then the, the adults will emerge in the late summer, and then they'll overwinter again as adults. Okay. There are uh, various insecticides that are labeled for use with flea beetle. Again, North Dakota has had, for several years, about a million acres of canola. So they've got a whole team of scientists that spend a lot of their time working on canola. One of their research centers, the Langdon Research Center in the northeast part of the state, that's, that is the primary crop that they do research on. So they've got a lot of good information in the state on canola and management of things, including the flea beetles. So they're a pretty good source of information, I think. Other insect pests of canola uh, specifically are the diamondback moth. Okay, and you can see the economic threshold. Bertha armyworm, so it's not unique to canola, but the Bertha armyworm can be a, a problem. And then there's some other insect pests, and again, some of these are general uh, feeders, again, like cutworms and grasshoppers. So there are several insect pests that can attack canola, and some of the, these are kind of unique to canola, so you just need to be aware of them. As is the case with um, the pulses, although we, we haven't seen the acres of canola yet, although it's becoming more popular again, there, we are seeing some disease problems uh, with canola. So <clears throat> black leg and alternaria black spot, can come in and, and attack canola, particularly if it's in a tight rotation and you've been growing canola for a while now. Sclerotinia or white mold really attacks virtually all broadleaf crops are susceptible to it, although not all show symptoms. But canola is one which can really be devastated by a, a white mold invasion or infestation. Aster's yellow is, is one that is occasionally encountered, uh, and there's some wilts. Rotation requirements for oil seeds. Uh, for canola and mustard, both are insurable again in, in Ponderé County. Okay, unlike uh, the pulses, it's one year out, at least presently in Montana. So if you're growing canola in 2021, then you you can't have um, <clears throat> canola in 2019 because it's one year out. 2020, then you could go back and grow canola. And you see some other crops listed as well. Cranby, for those of you not familiar with Cranby, it's another oilseed crop. Um, it's It was a competitor with rapeseed, and it was a great crop to grow. It would have done fantastic and did in Montana as well as in North Dakota, but um, really it was a, a marketing uh, challenge that developed, and that's really what drove Cranby out. So really don't see too much Cranby anymore, okay? There are no rotational restrictions with flax presently 
um, in Tonderay County. Okay, I talked about this study last year. Uh, we do have a matrix trial in place back at Moxon, and there also is a duplicate trial in place at the uh, Western Triangle Ag Research Center in Conrad, so uh, in, your, in your neighborhood. Um, this last year, 2020, was the third year of this study. And what we've got is we've got five different crops. You can see them listed on the bottom, canola, lentil, pea, barley, and spring wheat. And we plant these crops in an experimental design in one direction. So this is from the bottom to the top of your screen. We started this study in 2018 at both locations. In 2019, we plant these same five crops in a perpendicular location. So we have 25 different potential two-year sequences, crop sequences in this study. We have canola on top of canola. We have canola following field pea. We have canola following lentil, canola following wheat, and canola following barley. And we have that for all the other crops as well. So in, in 2020, which was our third year, we've actually been growing canola for three consecutive years. So of course we, we've thrown ourselves out of, of crop insurance if we, if, we were, if we had these crops insured, which we don't, it's a research study. But, so why are we doing this? Well, among other things, we really do wanna see how many years we can grow some of these crops before we really run into a disease problem, before we really want to run into a weed problem. And we wanna see what sort of advantages exist if rather than growing them continuously, we grow canola following wheat? Or is it better to, to grow canola following barley? Or how about peas following canola? Is that any better than peas following wheat or peas following peas? So that's really the idea behind this. So here are results from 2020. I mean, some of the results were what we would expect. Other results, uh, not as much. And that's why we do studies like this at multiple locations and across several years. So this is just a snapshot. So table three, and this is the one I'm gonna concentrate on a little bit more, not because the yields were necessarily all that great, because if you look down at Conrad, which is the table on the bottom, yields were actually better at Conrad than they were at um, Moccasin. But from a, a research standpoint, statistically, we couldn't say too much about what we saw at Conrad, we could say more at Moccasin, even though the yields were lower. So that's really what I'm gonna focus on. And, and like I said, some of the what we saw was what we would expect. So along the um, left part of the tables, you'll see the five crops listed in alphabetical order, barley, canola, lentil, pea, and spring wheat. And that was the crops planted in 2019. On the top were the crops planted in 2020. So that first column that says barley on top, you know, you go down to the intersection between the barley on top and the barley on the left, and you see that 2,538 uh, pounds per acre. Um, that was the yield of barley in 2020 that followed barley in 2019, and for that matter, followed barley in 2018. The next number you see is 2,616 pounds per acre. Okay, so that's barley following canola in 2019, and then barley was planted in that in those plots in 2018. So you kind of see how this goes. So what did we see that we would we would expect? Well, look at the lentil uh, column. Lentil did best following spring wheat, right? Thir uh, 1,373 pounds per acre. It did similar statistically though following canola, which really was not what we would expect. We would think that lentil would, would might do best following spring wheat, but it should be pretty much the same following barley, and that's not what we observed this past year, okay? Um, in terms of what did it, what did it yield the least after, after lentil, which is what we would expect. Look at the P column. Here we did get pretty much what we expected. Um, peas did best following wheat and 
barley, and it really didn't matter which of those two peas did uh, equally as well. Peas did worse following canola, lentil, and pea, and in terms of arithmetic mean, pea did the poorest when it followed itself. And, and from a rotation standpoint and a disease standpoint, that's exactly what you'd expect. Of all those crops up there, what are peas most unlike? Small grains. And that's what they did best after. What are the what is pea most alike of the small of the five crops up there? Peas. And that's what it did worse or, or um, porous after. So the pea column is pretty much what we'd expect. Now you can see our canola yields at Moxon were, were low across the board. Um, but um, we really statistically weren't able to tell much, any kind of difference across those crops as well. So in the case of spring wheat, what we what we observed actually was not what we expected. We would think spring wheat would probably do best after peas and after lentils, when in fact, uh, you know, it performed pretty similarly across uh, the crops. But statistically speaking, the, the highest yields were spring wheat after barley. And that's not what we would expect. So that's why we do studies like this. I do think over time, as we continue this study, we will, in the end, uh, over several years, see what we would expect to see where, say, spring wheat's probably going to do best after peas, but not every year. And, and, you know, that's the thing you have to remember about with rotations. We can provide general guidelines, and I think over several years they will be true, but you're not always going to see that each and every year because of the unique conditions that occur. My, my other point with having this up here is to let you know that not too far from you, the Conrad, uh, the Western Triangle Research Extension Center outside of Conrad has this study in place and a lot of other uh, good information for you. Justin Vetch is the superintendent there now, and you know they're going to have pea and lentil variety trials and canola, so they'll be a really great source of information. Fertilization for canola uh, and mustard, I think we all are aware of this. Um, you know, they require nitrogen just like any other crop. Um, so you have to, you know, you should soil test. Soil test is a pretty good indication of, of nitrogen uh, needs. But sulfur is the big one, and I think we know this. Um, if you're growing canola, the recommendation currently is um, you're, you want to apply a little bit of sulfur. The soil test for sulfur, you can conduct it but it really isn't a good predictor of yield response. So again, as insurance, um, unless you know for a fact that you're in an environment that has lots of available sulfur to the crop, as insurance at the research center, for example, we typically apply 20 pounds of sulfur when we're growing canola. And we really don't look at the soil test um, with sulfur. It's just not very diagnostic. If we know we have uh, an environment where the soil test, for, you know, we've never grown canola in the field before, um, soil test indicates really, really low levels, even though it's not a really good indicator, we might bump it up to 40 pounds of sulfur, okay? Now, <clears throat> the thing about um, nitrogen and these other nutrients is, uh, and that's what this slide uh, represents, and again, this one was provided by Clay Jones, Canola and mustard, for that matter, are going to, but particularly canola, is going to respond to nitrogen, but only if, if sulfur is available as needed. So <clears throat> if you look along the x-axis here, this is sulfur that is available in pounds per acre. And along the y-axis is canola seed yield. And then you can look at the nitrogen rates from 0 to 135 pounds. Well, notice if uh, the sulfur is very, very low in, in the soil. You know, the amount that's actually available to the plant is very, very low. What happened when you applied increasing amounts of nitrogen? Your yield actually decreased. It's only when sulfur was available at the, at the uh, rate that the plant needed where you actually saw a stair-step nitrogen response like you would expect. So you really do need to be aware of when you're growing canola, not just nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but also sulfur and really key in, in on that. And as I said, at the research center, when we grow canola, we apply 20 pounds of sulfur. Now that's, it doesn't matter what the, the soil test tells us. We apply 20 pounds of sulfur as insurance. 
if you if you know for a fact that you've got a very high sulfur environment, you may get away with not uh, needing to apply any sulfur, but it is good insurance. Now, sulfur is like nitrogen. It's going to move in the soil. So it is, depending on the form of sulfur that you apply, and I think a real popular one is ammonium sulfate, that's going to move just like nitrogen does. So you do need to be aware of that. So you don't want to over-apply sulfur, um, but 20 pounds isn't a whole lot. And if you've got a canola crop that's going to yield fairly well, it's going to use that much. Mustard is not as sensitive as is canola to sulfur, uh, although it does have relatively high uh, requirements for sulfur compared to small grains. Okay, I did mention ammonium sulfate. If you're not familiar with that uh, fertilizer, it does contain sulfur. It also contains nitrogen, but it's a low nitrogen source. It only contains, you know, about 21% nitrogen. So Comparing that to urea, it's less than half the amount of nitrogen that is contained in urea. So, you know, if you're thinking, well, gosh, I'll just use ammonium sulfur as my um, not only sulfur source, but my nitrogen source, unless you don't need much nitrogen, it's probably not going to work for you because you'd have to apply a lot of it in order to fulfill your nitrogen needs and you'd be applying way more, more sulfur than you need. We control uh, much more of a problem in mustard than canola, as I said. Uh, we do have clear field canola and we do have other uh, types of canola that are resistant to weeds. We don't have that same option with uh, mustard. A lot of grass control options, but really uh, with mustard, uh, not any uh, post-emergence broadleaf control options. So you, you want to avoid fields that have heavy broadleaf weed pressure if you're growing mustard. It's not, not as much of a problem if growing canola. Be aware though, if you are growing uh, canola, that there are some uh, plant back intervals you need to be aware of. You know, some of these do have carryover and depending on what you're, you plan on growing after canola, you could run into some um, herbicide carryover problems. So you just need to be aware of, of that. And again, this is, I lifted this, this was last year, but they have the table in the North Dakota Weed Control Guide, which I really like, they do show plant back uh, restrictions for many of the herbicides that we use in Montana uh, for the various crops. Harvesting. Canola and mustard can be combined directly, and, and more and more of it is. It can also be swathed. But this was much more of a problem um, back before there was uh, shatter-resistant canola. Canola, there are varieties now that we grow that are, are pretty resistant to shatter. So a lot of the canola and the mustard, mustard was always less resistant to uh, shatter than was canola. But a lot of the canola and mustard anymore is combined directly. And all of the canola and the mustard that we grow at the research center, we do combine directly. Okay, so which crop do you want to grow under dry conditions? You know, all things being equal. Well, yellow mustard actually requires less water to reach reproductive potential than canola or brown mustard. Okay. Okay, so it, it you know if you, if you compare a canola up on top, it requires about five inches of water to get to reproductive stage. Okay. A lot like spring wheat, actually. Spring wheat requires a little bit more, but um, pretty pretty close to spring wheat. Okay, in the in the case of brown mustard, it actually requires a little bit more water, about 5.6 inches. Yellow mustard only requires about three inches of of, of water available before it's going to start to produce um, seed. But yield potential is lower. So <clears throat> you know if you have a really really dry uh, environment, which none of us want. I mean, you know, you're really suffering from drought. All things being equal, yellow mustard would probably be a good bet for you. But, you know, if you have uh, average, even at Conrad average or greater than average amounts of, of water, canola in terms of yield is going to be the better bet because the yield potential is much higher in canola than it is in yellow mustard. And that's what this shows right here. If you look at plant available water, <clears throat> you know, canola just, it's going to out yield mustard 
under increasingly uh, favorable growing conditions. It's just an inherent part of, of those two species. Okay, straight cutting mustard maturity should be relatively even. Um, you can see what the seed moisture content needs to be. It needs to be relatively dry. It, you can't harvest it at a, a, a higher moisture content, but then it will need to be dried down. If you do swath these crops, the swath or the windrow is very, very light. You're probably gonna need to, to roll it to push it down into the stubble or it'll likely blow. Okay, uh, mustard in particular is susceptible to uh, shattering if it's dry. You know, if you're waiting for that dry moisture content where you don't have to artificially dry down. So you, you need to slow the cylinder speed down a, a bit. North Dakota has an excellent canola production field guide. Uh, Canada does as well. They're out there and, and there's a lot of uh, great information in them. Okay, very quickly moving on to flax. Again, you can seed it early. You can seed flax early. Uh, and, you know, it's a fuller uh, season crop. It's indeterminate in its uh, flowering. So as long as conditions favor uh, seed production, it'll continue to uh, produce seed. And, you know, you'll go out in the morning and you'll see a flax field and it's blue. And you'll go out late in the day and the flowers are gone. And you go out the next day and you'll see the flowers and they're the field's blue again, and that can continue for quite a long time if conditions are favorable to uh, seed development, okay? So you do want to seed it early. Again, you want to avoid those dry conditions. Um, the seed is, is larger than mustard or canola, but, you know, it's kind of flat. It looks like a, a, a small tier. So you can seed it as deep as an inch and a half. Uh, I usually don't. We usually don't. We'll seed it, you know, about an inch. Um, it, it comes up in our soils just fine when we seed it at an inch depth. Firm moist soil following as a small grain is ideal. It sounds like a broken record. Uh, targeted population is, is pretty heavy, you know, about 70 plants per square foot. So 25 to 30 pounds of seed per acre would be the seeding rate. Uh, flax is like lentil, not real competitive with weeds. So the less flax plants you have out there, the less competition there will be with weeds. Okay, and this is flax seeded at the research center. We've been going growing flax at the research center since I've shown up. And we like it. I like it. You know, it, it's a nice crop to grow. It's it's a little tricky to harvest. Uh, the straw is um, <clears throat> pretty tough to cut. So we typically are going to wait uh, a little bit um, later than. Um, you know, we might with other crops before we combine it, but we do straight cut it. Okay, and there's the seedling a little bit uh, further into development. We really don't have a serious, we haven't encountered a serious insect uh, problem with flax. Occasionally, um, we can get leaf hoppers that'll come in and they're not so much a problem themselves, but they can be a carrier of a disease. But typically flax really is, is not a, a a crop that I've got a lot of concern in terms of insects. Grasshoppers, yeah, will clip the bowl sometimes, but um, you know there are insect pests which can cause damage. If you've got a severe wireworm problem, you, you probably are going to have a, a problem in your flax crop. But I like it because there's there's not a flea beetle uh, out there or a, a pea leaf weevil, at least to date, that really you can count on being a serious problem. There are various uh, diseases that you need to be aware of. You know, we've been kind of fortunate because we haven't seen a lot of flax acres in Montana recently, although we are starting to see those acres climb. And the more flax we have and the more it is in our rotations, in a tight rotation, the more we can expect to see some disease problems develop. North Dakota does have a public plant breeder. Um, so North Dakota does, is involved in development of new flax varieties. I've been trying to get um, the breeder to send some of his material out to Cark so we can take a look at it, but so far haven't had too much success. Flax does have some pretty good weed control options for both grasses and broadleafs post-emergence. And of course, there are some good options pre-emergence and there are some desiccants that can be used 
Um, if you do happen to have a, a weedy field, or like I said, you know, it we, it really hasn't been a problem for us, but it is indeterminate in its um, in its flowering. So it's not like wheat where all the heads form at once. It will continue to produce bowls, these structures that contain the seed, as long as growing conditions favor to a point. Okay, so the bowls, they're little round bowls, um, and they contain the seed uh, found at the end of the, you know, the, the flax stems. Um, you want to harvest the flax plant when 90% of the bowls have turned brown. Oh, I'm sorry, when 90% of the bowls have turned brown. So I guess that's where I'll stop with flax, and then very, very quickly, um, there has been interest in and in some reporting of intercropping chickpeas and flax that continues. I talked about this last year. The reason it's done really is in part as some kind of blight control in chickpeas. Perry Miller has worked with uh, Clara Keen at the Williston Research uh, Extension Center in North Dakota, and they did and they continue to look at this. And the bottom line is they have collected uh, data that does suggest. There is something behind this that intercropping, growing the two crops together, does seem to reduce the incidence of ascochyta blight in chickpeas to some extent. They want to continue to look at this, but there does seem to be some preliminary research data to support this belief. And here are some of those data. You know, if you look along the the, the left column, you can see that's chickpea alone. That's what that monocrop chickpea. Uh, indicates, and then you can see the chickpea uh, along with increasing amounts of flax in it. And if you look at the ascochyta severity on the right side of the table here, look at July 31st or July 17th, but particularly July 31st, and you go from the chickpea planted alone to increasing amounts of flax in with the chickpeas, you'll notice a decreasing ascochyta severity uh, rating. So again, there does seem to be some data to support the belief that intercropping might um, impact ascochyta blight positively from a, a grower's perspective, but they want to continue to look at this. This is not the final say. Okay, so, you know, intercropping may reduce ascochyta blight. Uh, 15 pounds of flax may, may also help in chickpea dry down. 20 pounds or more of flax intercropped with chickpea does uh, tend to reduce chickpea yield a little bit. All right, and then these were just some challenges. If you are growing these or any other crops, I had a question the other day about uh, barley and lentil. There can be some challenges in planting if the crops really differ in seed size. And think about the size of chickpea seed versus the side of flax, very, very different. So. You know, ideally, what you've got is a couple different uh, boxes on your grain drill. If you if you're planting with a grain drill or some other way to keep those seeds separate, um, or in the in the the box or the container, there may see, be some seed separation that you don't want before you can get to placing that seed in the ground. Be aware of with uh, when you're starting to grow crops together for grain or seed that sometimes it'll take you out of some herbicide options that you otherwise would have if you're growing them separately. Synchrony of plant growth can be a problem in some instances, you know, if growing chickpeas and flax together, ideally you want them both to mature at about the same time. You don't want to have one crop that needs to be harvested now and the other crop is still green. And finally, harvesting, after you do harvest them, you need to have some way of separating the seed out. Now, with chickpea and, and flax, you know, it's, it's not a big, big problem um, because the seed size is so different. But with some other crops, if you're growing them together, sometimes those seed sizes are pretty similar and you have to ask yourself the question, okay, how am I going to separate these seeds now? All right, so that is... Is what I have. I'm sorry I went a little, I went quite a ways uh, beyond what I thought I would. And you guys didn't ask too many questions, so I can't blame the, the questions. But if there's any other, anything else that you want to say or ask, um, feel free to do that. It's not looking like we've got anything in person. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, we have a couple minutes for the chat here. Um, all of those of you are thinking in the chat, um, this does get you a pesticide credit. So if you want to pop your license number in the chat, then you can keep track of that. All right, it doesn't look like we've got any more questions. Not seeing anything come in. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Pat, for joining us. Thank you, Adrian, for having me. I'm sorry I went. <laughs> Usually I don't talk too long, but I definitely went over tonight, so I apologize. Oh, it's easy to do on webinars. Okay. Well, stay warm. <laughs> <laughs>